हेलो एंड वेलकम टू बाई जूस एग्जाम ट्रैप आई ए एस वेरी वेरी वॉर्म गुड मॉर्निंग टू एवरी वन आई होप ऑल ऑफ यूर डूइंग गुड आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू टूडेज लाइफ सेशन ऑफ द हिंदू न्यूज पेपर एनालिसिस एज यू नो एवरी सिंगल डे राइट हेयर एट टेन ए वी ब्रिंग दिस लाइफ सेशन फॉर यू वेर वी डिस्कस द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक्स फ्रॉम द डेज हिंदू न्यूज पेपर बोथ फॉर द मेन्स एग्जामिनेशन एंड फॉर द प्रिलिम्स एग्जामिनेशन एज वेल आई वुड लाइक टू शेयर वन वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग हेयर अ लॉट ऑफ एस्पिरेंट्स हैव अबिट of skipping the hindu newspaper on a sunday the reason being that many students think that on sundays we don't have the editorial page of the hindu newspaper so they think it is better to skip it but please do not make that mistake because if you see carefully on sundays the hindu has some other extra pages for example usually on sundays they have an extra page where they just carry news about science and environment related topics so science environment related topics the topics from where usually you see questions from current affairs only those are mostly covered in the hindu newspaper on sundays like they have been covered today as well so please make sure you do not miss out on sunday's newspaper as well because science and technology and environment will give you a very very important edge also before we go ahead and start analyzing the paper there is a very very important announcement and i would like all of you to listen to me very very carefully The announcement is for the next two days. That is Monday and Tuesday. The next two days, the live session of the Hindu newspaper analysis would be at 5 p.m. in the evening, not at 10 a.m. This is just for the next two days. Please do remember this. For the next two days, that is tomorrow and day after tomorrow, Monday and Tuesday only. the live hindu newspaper analysis session that we are having today would be at 5 pm in the evening and from wednesday onwards we will then again come back to 10 am so please do make that note don't worry just because we are not here at 10 am tomorrow doesn't mean that we are missing it out for the next two days you have to join us at 5 pm in the evening and from wednesday we will be back at 10 am so let's now begin with what are the topics that we have to discuss these are the important topics we have picked out from today's hindu newspaper as you can see there are a lot of science and environment related topics that we have we will start our discussion with the impact of deforestation then we will talk about a fatal virus infection that is spreading in west bengal that is impacting children specifically so we'll be discussing about that then we'll be discussing about what is uk's new policy on refugees they have been trying to pass a new law to kind of punish those refugees coming to the uk on boats so we'll be discussing what that is for specifically prelims point of view we will be discussing sickle cell anemia that is the sickle cell anemia a disease that the government of india is trying to eliminate by 2047 but our target is very very far off from where we are so we'll be discussing that as well fifth topic will be iran saying that they have signed a deal with russia to buy the sukhoi jets sixth topic will be again from science how the world's fastest camera has been developed then we'll be discussing about a chinese vaccine that is not found to be effective against japanese encephalitis we'll be discussing what that is what are different types of vaccines that are available then we will have crypto trade that is now under pmla prevention of money laundering act we'll be discussing what that is why is crypto now a part of pmla and in the end we will be discussing about why there was a big news yesterday that the silicon valley bank one of the largest banks in america all of a sudden failed we'll be discussing why that happened so let's begin what are the topics that we have for you with the first important topic that is the evil effects of deforestation now as i told you earlier as well mostly on sundays you will see a lot of news related to science related to environment one specific page is reserved for that first article is about what happens in case deforestation increases what happens when our forest area decreases now let's start with a very simple basic idea about forest cover in india now governments across the world including india are trying to increase their forest cover in fact the government of india has been trying to increase forest cover so that they can act as carbon sink as you know we have made a commitment that you had nf triple c also that 
we will be increasing our carbon sink capacity so that we can get rid of more and more emissions. If India has to achieve its goal of meeting the net zero target by 2070, increasing our forest cover, increasing carbon sink is important. Now, as a policy in India, our aim is that we want to reach 33% forest cover in India. We want to reach 33% forest cover in India. Now, let me ask you this question. Can you tell me quickly, right now, what is the forest cover in India? Meaning that out of the entire area that Indian landmass has, how much is covered under forest? Any idea? The goal is 33%, but where are we right now? Are we nearby the goal? Okay, I have 24%, 25%, 24 and a half. A lot of people are stuck in 24, 25, 24, 25. Okay, so how do we come to know about that? Let's try and understand this. What is the report from the government of India side that would tell us what is the forest cover? So there is something called the Forest Survey of India. The Forest Survey of India is a report, it's a biennial report, means this report comes once in two years. So every ordinary year we have a report called the Forest Survey of India. This report tells us about the forest cover. The last time this report came in was in 2021. Uh, before that it was 2019, before that 2017. So this year 2023 also this report will come out. As per the last report, the last edition that we had in 2021, the report said we are close to about, let's say, 22%, 21 point something. Many people say that now that the report will come out. In 2023, when the report comes out, India would be close to 24%. So we have to wait for the report to come out. But usually, it is said that India would be now close to 24%, somewhere between 24 and 25%. But still, we are very, very far off as compared to what our goal is. Our goal is to reach 33% forest cover. Now, the problem is not just India. Nations around the world have a problem that the forest cover is decreasing. Do you remember there was this news of widespread wildfire in the Amazon forest in Brazil specifically? Do you remember that? In Brazil, there was so much wildfire in the Amazon forest. People around the world, celebrities were making appeals that we should control this. Brazil, on the other hand, the Brazilian government was not doing a lot of things. They were not really trying to control that. Mainly because Brazil said and Brazilian president at that point of time said that our population is increasing. We need more area for our development. We need more area to set up factories, to set up houses, etc. So we have to make more area for us available. We have to clear that area. So the population pressure that we have is for every country, including India. When you have more population, when, for example, government of India says we want to invest more in manufacturing, we want to give a push to make in India, we want to set up more factories. Now, where would you set up the factories? To set up these factories, you require huge tracts of land. And that land is usually acquired by cutting down the forest. So what has happened is in the past, a lot of forest area around the world has been diverted for some other usage. For example, WHO says that since 1990, 420 million hectares of forest have been diverted to some other uses, including agriculture, industrial use and even biofuels. Countries such as India, China, a lot of countries in Africa mainly have cut down their forest because they want to use it for some other purposes because of the population pressure that they are facing. And this is a negative sign. Around the world, if you look at the average forest cover, and we are talking about the entire world right now, the average forest cover is about 31% as per the Food and Agriculture Organization. They say about 31% of the entire landmass of the earth is covered in the forest. So India, as you can see, is much below the world average as well. The problem is, once you start deforestation, once you have deforestation at a larger scale, once the trees start falling down, there are a lot of negative impacts that we see. And I'm sure all of you are very well aware of this. Since your school, you have been reading about the negative impact of deforestation. First, they assist global warming. The lesser trees that you have, the lesser will be the carbon sink. 
meaning that there will be much more accumulation of carbon dioxide because trees would be inhaling carbon dioxide when you don't have trees you will have much more carbon dioxide openly in the atmosphere that will lead to global warming as per the experts deforestation increases 11 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions not just this deforestation can also lead to infectious germs there are diseases that are linked to deforestation because again when you have deforestation the air quality in a certain area would be much lower as compared to what it should be so planting of trees having greenery has a positive impact on the environment as well not just this deforestation also has an impact on clean drinking water now the lesser trees that you have more is the issue of soil erosion because the trees actually ensure that the top layer of the soil remains intact the lesser trees that you have especially the older trees when you cut them down you're allowing all the nutrients of the soil to go away the trees also release water into the atmosphere through transpiration when water evaporates from their leaves that also make sure that the rainfall in the area is much better these are just some of the examples of how trees help us live a much better life and this is something that even a class 5 kid knows it is not something that only the experts know people who go to the school they also know what are the good impact or what are the positive impacts of having a lot of trees around us so this is not something which is a hidden secret but the problem here is when the government is in power they have to take a decision of whether they want a lot of trees or whether they want development because see when the population is increasing when the government has a responsibility to give more and more jobs to the people the government has to give a push to manufacturing as the government is doing right now so how do you set up all these factories manufacturing industries if you don't cut down these trees so that is always a decision that the governments have to take this is always a dilemma that is present in the government's mind now if you look at India's status as I told you India's forest cover and this data is from the 2021 version of the forest survey of India if you look at the 2021 data it shows that 22 percent of India's areas under forest cover right now as and when the 2023 report comes out it is expected to go about 25 percent or so the government is also now planning to divert a lot of other forest areas into some other kind of activities for example take the example of andaman nicobar islands andaman nicobar islands a majority of the area in these islands are under the forest however in the past the government has been building a lot of infrastructure in andaman and nicobar for example, the government believes that these islands have a lot of strategic importance for India. They present India with a great advantage. We can ensure that we have an eye on the Indian Ocean. We can use this. But for that, we have to have better infrastructure in these islands. So new airports, new ports, etc. are being built. The government, in fact, is encouraging more and more people to go and settle in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. This also has a negative impact on the ecological status of Andaman Nicobar. Not just these states. Look at the Himalayan states, Jammu Kashmir, Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh. In all these areas, there has been a lot of development activities in the form of highways, bridges, etc. that are being built. All of that would only be built if there is a lot of deforestation on a larger scale. Then there are other examples that the article gives. In Goa, for example, the Mumbai Goa highway is being expanded to four lane highway for that about 31,000 trees will be cut down. National Highway Authority of India again is cutting down very old banyan trees in order to ensure that the Chevela Mandal highway in Telangana that actually becomes much broader. So there are a lot of examples that we see around the country where the governments are giving priority to development to infrastructure as compared to environment and you can't blame the government always for that who would not want broader roads when you go on the roads and you say there's a lot of traffic jam the government has to listen to you the only option the government has is to expand those roads for expansion obviously you would need to cut down on the trees so this is always a choice a decision that the government has to make between what development do we want and what exactly is it that we are ready to pay for it now if you look at the data and this is a data i have taken from 
uh, Indian Express because Indian Express a few days back carried an article about India's forest cover, how is it measured specifically. This data tells you year on year how exactly has India's forest cover changed. For example, in 2021, as I told you the report that was published, the Forest Survey of India, India's total percentage of forest cover was 21.71%. This is constantly increasing, but at a very, 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 very slow pace. For example, 2019, the forest cover was 21.67%. 2017, it was 21.55%. So when you have such a, such a small increase, such a gradual increase, you cannot expect India to meet the target of 30, 33% anytime soon. And that also becomes a problem. Now, I also want to tell you one more thing. How exactly is the forest cover in India classified? How do we measure it? Let me ask you one simple question. If let's say there is a five hectare area that I own, if I own the five hectare area and there are a lot of trees in that area, would that, call be, would that be called a forest area or not? <coughs> Just try and answer this question. If I own a certain piece of land, let's say five hectares, it has a lot of trees, would the government call it a forest area or not? Because I own this, government doesn't own this. Is ownership also a factor while deciding the canopy cover? These are some of the facts that you must understand. Now, let me tell you how exactly does the government measure how much forest area that we have. So, in terms of the Forest Survey of India report, what we do is, this report counts all the plots of one hectare or above. So minimum piece of land should be one hectare or above. Doesn't matter who owns that land. Ownership can be private ownership also. It can be government ownership also. But one hectare of land having at least 10% tree canopy density. Now what is tree canopy density? If this is land and this is a tree. Now the trees have this crown shape. This is canopy. So this canopy is covering how much of the entire area. That is how it is decided whether it is a forest or not. If at least 10% of tree canopy density exists, then it will be called a forest area in at least one hectare. Doesn't matter who owns it. It can be your land, my land, government's land, doesn't really matter. There are three categories of forest. First, Open forest. Open forest is when the canopy density is 10 to 40 percent. So 10 to 40 percent canopy density would be called an open forest. Second category called dense forest is when the canopy density is 40 to 70 percent. 40 to 70 percent will be dense forest. And then very dense forest where the canopy density is over 70 percent. Please do remember these are the three categories of how forests are earmarked in India. There are open forests, there are dense forests and there are very dense forests depending upon the canopy density that we have. What about the land pieces which are smaller than one hectare? For those which are smaller than one hectare, we also try and count them but they are not counted as forest. They are counted as tree cover. They are counted as tree cover. So only those land area which is over one hectare will be called as forest cover. If we are talking about that land area which is less than one hectare, that will be called tree cover area. So if you look at this graph, it shows you forest area is this much and forest plus tree cover area is this much. So please don't be confused. There is a number 21.71%, then there is a number 24.62%. 21.71 is the forest cover. 24.62 is forest plus tree cover. So if the question is only on forest cover, that is different. If the question is on forest plus tree cover, that is different. So please don't be confused with that. In forest area, we only consider those pieces of land which is at least one hectare or more than that. In tree, we consider those areas which are less than one hectare. So please do remember that. It is extremely, extremely important. This was the first topic about deforestation. Let me see. If there are a few questions before we move on. Aarti, for prelims point of view, from this topic, you can be asked a lot of things. How is the forest cover measured? 
different categories of forest, definition between tree cover, forest cover, all these things can be asked. If the 2013 report comes in before the prelims examination, then 2013 report of Forest Survey of India, that is also very important. All these are extremely, extremely important. Uh, one of the question, what is the importance of carbon stock? So basically carbon sink are those areas with, with the dense forest cover where the trees can suck in much more carbon. So because they inhale carbon dioxide, they would be able to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that we have in the atmosphere. Then I have a question. Um, I'll take one more question from Kishan. Deforestation is some or how prerequisite of development. On the contrary, it leads to global warming, mass wasting, climate change. 33% is sufficient for balance on both sides. 33% is sufficient, but we are nowhere near the 33%. You are correct in saying that development will always come at a cost. Whatever development is happening, be it in India, be it other countries, it usually always comes at a cost. You as a government have to decide what is more important for your development or you have to preserve your environment. I'll give you a very simple example. You know that China is right now the factory of the entire world, right? So China is where most of the stuff is made from the entire world. Now, there is one extremely important fact that many people don't really understand. A lot of products that China makes, it is not that America or European countries can't make those products. America can also make those products. European countries can also make those products which China is making. Yes, they might make it at a higher cost. The cost of manufacturing in China is much cheaper. But the fact is, Western countries want to give these kind of orders to China. They want the manufacturing to happen in China. Why? Because US, European countries, they don't want to pollute their environment. USA says or European countries says we also can produce if all these things if we want. We can also set up factories. We can also set up all these things. But we don't, to we don't want to pollute our environment. We are happy to give money to China. Let them have pollution. Let them have all the problems of manufacturing. We will just buy whatever the finished product is. So when you become a developed country, when you can afford these things, that I don't want to manufacture in my own country. I would rather buy everything by giving money. That is when a country has a luxury of saying that I will protect the environment. But when you are a developing country like India or when you are a, when you are a country with a low per capita income like India has, then there is not such of a luxury with the government. The government today cannot say that no, I will not go ahead and uh, do a development. I'll give you one other example. Let's say you go out of the house, you don't have any other job. Okay, let's take a simple example. Let's say you don't have any other job. The only job that you can have is you can cut down a tree and you can sell the wood to earn money. That is the only option you have. Now tell me, would you do that or not? Would you say that no, 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 environment is very important. I will not cut down on the tree. I will be hungry. My family will be hungry. No problem. But I will not touch the tree. Would you do that? No, you will not do that. You will cut down on the tree. You will sell the wood because at the end of the day for you, more important right now is sustaining yourself and sustaining your family. As simple as that. The same example applies to the government as well. So when we say the government should preserve environment that is fine but they also have to take a decision between what to give more preference the environment or the development of the people and that is where the balance is easy to say that we should strike a balance but i hope when you join the government you will realize it's not that easy to strike that balance anyway let's move ahead then the second article that we have is about uh, unfortunate news from West Bengal. So there is a bad virus that is spreading in West Bengal amongst children more specifically. There is a news from West Bengal that 19 children under the age of 5 have died recently in the state government of Bengal run hospitals. The main reason behind that as per the doctors is ARI which is acute respiratory infection. Now most of the children are those who had some other disease also and their immunity system was very very weak. Adenovirus infection is an infection that is considered as a cause of mortality for these children. It is like a flu infection and just like other flu infections it also has similar kind of systems that is headache, body ache, fever etc. 
the problem with this virus right now is as we have seen when covid 19 was a part of our lives and it is still is we would have seen in the news that how virus actually mutates time and time again because of mutation of virus all the medicines all the vaccines have to be redeveloped re-engineered time after time so if let's say we have a vaccine for a certain virus we made made the vaccine 10 years back doesn't mean the same vaccine will be effective even today every few months the virus keeps on mutating keeps on changing its shape keeps on changing its form and the vaccines also have to according to them keep on changing their forms <coughs> this is what the problem is right now in west bengal also this adenovirus infection is mutating it's changing its form and that is why we are seeing that in West Bengal specifically, the government is not being able to control this spread of a disease. Now, the problem is not just limited to West Bengal. The unfortunate part is that as an entire country, our performance when it comes to child health specifically is very, very, very bad. Wherever you talk about any health index, any health ranking, any nutrition ranking you will see that India's performance is not that great although the government of India has started a lot of initiatives we have the midday meal program we have the Anganwadis we have other programs under which nutrition is provided to children but the fact remains that in India child mortality rate is still very high in West Bengal infant mortality rate is 22 per 1000 live births under 5 mortality rate is 25.4 it is better than the national average, but still it is something that the state governments have to improve on. The other part where why West Bengal is struggling is, West Bengal is one of those states that see a lot of child marriage. Now what is the problem with child marriage and how is it connected to child mortality? See, child marriage would be when females specifically are married off at a very young age. Now, when females are married off, girls are married off at a very young age means their body physically specifically has not developed that much. And when they are forced to bear a kid, a mother that is weak, a mother that is underweight, a mother that does not have enough nutrition, a child born out of that mother would also have similar kind of issues. It has been proven time and time again. So when you have child marriages, and when a baby is born out of such a child marriage, the same issues that the mother is facing, the similar kind of issues are seen among the child as well. There have been multiple reports to suggest that in Bengal, there have been lot of instances of child marriage because of which these issues just keep on getting worse and worse. There's also a problem of anemia that we see in West Bengal amongst pregnant women and that also gets passed on from generation to generation. That is why the problem of child health not being given the kind of priority it should is not just in West Bengal. It is in fact in entire country that maternal health and child health have not been given the kind of preference or a kind of priority that they should. If you look at the data from the National Family Health Survey, the fifth edition, that data shows over 11% children from age of 16 to 26 to 23 months had inadequate dietary intake means they were not taking the kind of nutrition that their body needs india has made some progress but we are still very much behind the sustainable development goal number two that says that we should end all forms of malnutrition of children amongst under the age of five whenever we have the global hunger index rankings and india gets a very bad rank you always see how india is criticized around the world on the other hand, we say that no, this is a bad ranking, this is incorrect. But the reality is, indices such as a global hunger index don't just measure if you're hungry or not. They measure if you have adequate nutrition in your body or not. For example, if I give you rice to eat for entire year, every single day I only give you rice to eat, you will not die. You will still not be hungry. But your body will still be considered hungry because you don't have enough nutrition in your body. Same as the problem here. It is not about the quantity of food right now. We do have midday meal program. We do have the Anganwadis as well. It is more about the quality. 
it is more about the nutrition that is still lagging nutrition of child and nutrition of the mother as well in india malnutrition has always been a problem amongst mothers 24 percent of mothers in south asia means one in every four mother in south asia has a much lower bmi than they should have at the time when they are reproducing a child when their body lacks nutrition because at the time that the woman is pregnant their body has to provide for two people's nutrition and not just one it is a child's nutrition <coughs> and it is a mother's nutrition both of them have to be taken care of but our patterns of how the government schemes work have not been that effective as per who 810 women die every day <coughs> sorry due to preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth a lot of that can be rectified just by providing good enough nutrition these are some of the government schemes that the government has launched so far this data that i am showing you i have taken from the kurukshetra magazine as you know yojana kurukshetra magazine these magazines talk a lot about the government initiatives kurukshetra magazine in one of the earlier editions talked about child health maternal health where they told where they shared about different government schemes that the government has launched so far specifically about child and maternal health there is portion 2.0 it's a part of again the midday meal program we have pradhan mantri matra vanna yojana we have the national food security act but one of the other problems that we have to understand here is see it's easy to say that you should have nutrition everyone wants to be healthy no one will tell you no i don't want to be healthy everyone wants to be healthy but nutrition also comes at a cost when you go to the market today you try and buy something healthy as compared to something that is unhealthy healthier stuff will usually come at a higher cost not just this india's eating patterns are very different we intake most of our calories in the form of carbohydrates we are a country that eats a lot of rice eats a lot of chapati etc so the problem is that our intake has mostly carbohydrates not many protein not many other micronutrients so our eating pattern also is a part of the problem a lot of people in india still do not take non vegetarian food because that is how they have been brought up so they are important source of protein also in that manner is actually cut down yes you can compensate with alternatives in vegetarian but again they are costly so for that for having green vegetables for having uh, cottage cheese etc you have to spend more money this is where the government has to come in the picture next we have an article from the united kingdom <clears throat> the uk has a new policy under which uk has decided that now they will be much more stricter with the illegal immigrants around the world in the past few years what has happened is a lot of people from those countries which are undergoing some kind of conflict let's say afghanistan libya syria eritrea a lot of people from these parts of the world have been trying to escape their countries and go and seek asylum in europe a lot of european countries have a very free asylum or refugee policy if you go to these countries and say that my life is in danger in my country many people expect that they will be given refuge but that is not true with every country everyone wants to have a better life so many people illegally they contact some travel agents they go on small boats and they try to run away to other countries hoping that when we reach the other country we will be able to get asylum now many developed countries are not happy with that <clears throat> hungary is one example hungary has been very much against this kind of immigration uk also is one example in fact rishi sunak when he became the prime minister one of the promises that he made was that he will be very very strict with illegal migration why see uk and most of the developed nations say that when people come to our country illegally without any documentation number one it is difficult to have a background check it is difficult to see are they safe or not secondly when they come in without having many skills without having much education they become a burden on the government 
See, when you go to UK or US and you have skills, education, you can work there, the government will always be welcoming you because then you will contribute to their tax, you will contribute to their economy. But if you go to US and UK and say, I don't have any education, I can't work, I don't know anything, I will just be dependent here on the government. If the government helps me with its subsidies grade, then the government will not be helping you. Those governments want to help their citizens and not immigrants or refugees. This is a problem that UK also has. A lot of illegal refugees have been coming to UK for a long time and now the UK government is trying to pass a bill. That bill is called Illegal Migration Bill. The Illegal Migration Bill will be a bill under which if someone comes to UK illegally on a boat more specifically, they will be detained and they will be immediately sent back to either their own country from where they came if their life is in danger in that country, then they will be sent to some other country. But UK says we will not keep them in our country. Now, let me ask you this question. A few months back, British government signed a deal with an African country. And the deal was that if illegal migrants come to our country, we will send them to your country. You take care of them. Can you tell me which country was that? Which country was that with which UK signed a deal saying that if illegal migrants come to our country, we will not keep them. We will send them to your country. We will give you money. You take care of them. Yes, as many intelligent people are saying in the chat, Rwanda. We will discuss about that in just a bit. UK of some time back signed a deal with Rwanda saying that if illegal migrants come to our country, we will send them to Rwanda. You take care of them, you help them with the paperwork process. We will give you money for their sustenance, but don't let them enter UK. They were kind of exporting their dirty work that you do the work, we will give you money for that. And developed countries do that. Developed countries have done that in the past. Australia has also done that. There are multiple nations that have done that in the past. So UK is now trying to pass this bill. They have not passed it so far. As expected, this is being opposed by many people as well. The UN Human Rights Commission has opposed this. European Union also. The liberal countries have opposed this. They say this is illegal. It should not be done. The migrants will be in danger. You cannot send them back. But UK says we are not a part of EU. We can do whatever we want. And they, are, they say that we are not killing anyone. We are just sending them back. We are telling everyone if you want to come to UK, come legally. Don't come illegally. So as per the bill, Home Secretary, that is their Home Minister, would be able to detain and remove these illegal immigrants, send them back to either Rwanda, the country with which they have signed the deal, or to any other safe third country, or to any, their own country. Only those will be given some time to wait who are unfit to fly. If there are some people who are unfit, if there are only minors, they don't have any parents with themselves, then they will not be forced out. But after some time, they will also have to go back. So they will not accept anyone who comes to UK illegally. Till now, UK only allows people from some countries to come without much of documentation. Like from Afghanistan, from Ukraine also, they allow refugees. From Hong Kong also because Hong Kong was under the British for a long time till 1997. So if you are a British national from Hong Kong, from these places you can come. But from other places, no, you are not allowed to come without a proper paperwork, without having any documentation. The refugee problem is seen in two ways. Number one, a lot of people blame the Western countries only for it. See, which are the countries that are facing crisis? Libya. Syria, Afghanistan, Eritrea, when you talk about these countries which are facing crisis, most of those crises are because the Western countries interfered in those nations. If there would have been no interference of Western countries, there would have been no crisis. So when people are running away from their country, that is because it is the Western countries that have interfered. So many people think that Western countries have a responsibility towards them. But again, Western countries have not been ready to accept that. As I told you, it was in April 2022 that UK and Rwanda signed this memorandum of agreement. Now, this is not the only one. Australia also has something like this. 
Now you might say why is it that Rwanda would sign such an agreement? See when you are a poor country like Rwanda, why would you not want to earn money? Because it is not a free agreement. For Rwanda they will be getting money from UK. So for them it is fine. They are ready to take whatever whoever is coming because they would be getting money in return for doing this. They are not really concerned about human rights record. They are not concerned about giving a good treatment to people coming in. They are just happy that okay we will be able to get some money. That is the MOU signed between UK and Rwanda. Now this is not to punish people. I'll tell you, I'll explain to you what that is. So basically the idea was, let's say 1000 people come to UK illegally on a boat. Okay. Now what will happen is these 1000 people will be sent to Rwanda. It's not like a jail. What will happen is they will stay in Rwanda. From Rwanda, they will fill all the paperwork, etc. required for legally migrating to UK. That is the entire process. It's not a punishment that we are now sending you to jail. Not, nothing like that. They will be sent to Rwanda. From Rwanda, you will spend time there. From there, you will be filling up your paperwork, documentation. Then send that documentation to UK. If UK legally accepts you, then you will move to UK. If UK rejects it, then from Rwanda, you go back to your country. So Rwanda will be kind of an intermediary country in between. And they will be getting paid. That is how it would work for Rwanda. Now, what is the money arrangement? As per the agreement, UK will pay one time fee of about 120 pounds. Apart from that, they will also pay 4.7 million per day for about 25,000 asylum seekers. So Rwanda for a country of its size, for a country of its economy, Rwanda will be getting a lot of financial help from UK. So they like it. For them, it is a good way to earn money because for them, it is a way to kickstart their economy once again. They don't have a lot of industries there. They don't have a lot of... Uh, uh, other ways to earn money plus yes their human rights record is bad but who cares they don't care about the human rights record right now for them it is just a good way to earn money so this bill from UK has not been signed so far but it will be signed in the upcoming session of the parliament these were main specific topics now we move on to prelims specific topics from today's Hindu newspaper let's see what exactly are these let me quickly take up one or two questions Peter Parker has a question. Isn't now in the globalized world interdependence and interconnectedness leads to an is very heavy words, man. <laughs> Let me read that again. In this globalized and interdependence and interconnectedness leads to an asymmetrical relationship rather than symmetrical. <laughs> relationship between the two countries have always been asymmetrical. No two countries are the same in the entire history of the world. The powerful, the rich always have an advantage as compared to others. So I don't think you should expect that there should be symmetrical relationship that has always been asymmetrical. Doesn't matter which era we are living in, globalization or non-globalization. Kishan has a question. India also barring illegal immigrants under Foreigners Act and Passport Act of 1920. Another, any such other provisions for illegal migrants? No, we don't have any other such specific provision for illegal migrants. Again, we do have many illegal migrants in India. In India, we don't have a specific law for that. So in India, what happens is mostly when you don't have a law for something, it is because the government wants a free hand to decide on a case by case basis. So in India, anything about citizenship is decided by the home ministry. So home ministry can give uh, whenever they want, they can give citizenship to someone, they can remove citizenship, etc. So in India, we don't have specific laws for that. The home ministry gets a complete free hand so they can randomly give uh, asylum they can not asylum but they can randomly let's say decide to give citizenship or not for example we don't even have a law for asylum but we did give asylum to Dalai Lama so it is in India we don't really have specific laws what we do have is we ensure that the government of India home ministry specifically has a free hand in ensuring or in deciding how the decisions will be taken in this regard Let's move on to then prelims specific information, fact based factual information that is handy for the prelims. First page of the Hindu newspaper talked about sickle cell anemia. Now sickle cell is a very very dangerous disease sickle cell anemia. Let me tell you in simple terms what the disease is. So 
the red blood cells that we have is are usually round they are very flexible so red blood cells can easily flow in our body because our red blood cells are flowing in our body easily that is how we are healthy and fit in this disease what happens is the red blood cells lose their shape they get a different kind of a shape like this of a crescent again my drawing is very bad but this like this is the kind of shape that they actually get this is a crescent shape when they lose their shape it is difficult for the red blood cells to move in the body when they can't move freely in the body they then actually make sure that the blood flow is then the blood flow is then hindered they create a lot of blockages at different parts in the body it leads to a lot of problems in the body because a lot of body organs don't get the supply of blood that they require so sickle cell anemia is a very very dangerous disease it's one of those diseases that is very difficult to detect also because usually when you go to a doctor your normal doctor and you say i have a problem in this part of the body or pain in this part of the body they will not say that you have sickle cell anemia that is something that is not really at the top of their mind so these kind of diseases remain very problematic these kind of diseases are very difficult to detect early on now the government of india had announced recently that we want to eliminate sickle cell anemia by 2047 but this article says that the government the health ministry specifically is very 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 far from their goal the health ministry has completed only 1% of their target to scan 1 crore people for the disease by 2022-23 so government of india had made a target that by end of 2022-23 the end means 31st march 2023 government had made a target that by 31st march 2023 we will give or we will scan 1 crore people at least for this disease to see how fast it is spreading but right now it is only 1% of it that has been done only 1 lakh of those testing has been conducted as compared to the 1 crore goal that we have now because of that this government's or government's aim of controlling the sickle cell disease is very very far away it's a genetic disorder in fact many people or the expert doctors themselves say that if two people get married male and female if both of them have this disease and they have a baby there is a 25% chance that their baby will also carry the same disease this also remains a problem because when you have a disease that spreads from one generation to the other generation it is very very difficult for this disease to be controlled because the government cannot possibly have everyone scan the other problem is as i told you earlier as well when india or when any common person let's say goes to have a health checkup a lot of you would go to have a health checkup you get your blood test you get your urine tested etc you do not even think that you have to get tested for these kind of diseases as well because these are not a part of our day to day conversation so this is very very difficult for anyone to get detected by this and this is why the government has to take the responsibility of tracking as many people as possible the government wants to eliminate this by 2047 this is what the finance minister said in the 2023 speech but again when the government's aim is so far off usually what happens the governments don't take it at a priority basis let's say if you make an aim today that i want to appear for 2020 2030 upsc exam then you would not be attending this session you are attending this session maybe because you have an aim of 2023 or 2024 attempt but when you make an aim that you want to attend 2040 or 2030 exam you will take it very easy similarly when the governments make an aim to eliminate something after 20 years after 30 years usually you do not see the government working at a priority level for this what the government has done so far is they have made a central registry the central registry will have a database of all those people who are suffering from the sickle cell disease and the government is planning to ensure that they can track as many people as possible for this this will require a lot of money this will require a lot of effort from the side of the government but this is the government's responsibility because again 
whenever there is a specific disease that spreads to a large part of the population it becomes a burden on the government eventually because when a lot of people fall sick many of them who can't afford private health care will go to public health care facilities that is an added expenditure on the government only and that is why it is the government's responsibility to track and treat most of these kind of diseases the health ministry plans to screen 7 crore people by 2025-26 1 crore was scheduled by 2022-23 but as we discussed we are very very far off from that goal we have about what 18 days remaining till this financial year comes to an end and only 1 lakh people have been scanned against the target of 1 crore this disorder of the blood as we discussed is mainly because the cells change their shape they are not flexible anymore they are not able to flow properly so they can't carry oxygen to different parts of the body and that is why the body starts to show all these kind of problems next important news again since this is a prelims specific news we would mainly be focusing on the factual part of it the next important news from prelims point of view is Iran has announced that they have signed a deal with Russia for the supply of Russian Sukhoi fighter jets that is Su-35 version now as you can imagine not any country specifically those countries which are close to US those countries will obviously not sign any defense deal with Iran so Iran does not have many other options they have only a few options that would be willing to sell any weapons to them the option that Iran right now has is China or Russia with China also if you would have realized with China also Iran has signed multiple deals in fact China and Iran have signed a 400 billion dollar investment deal under which China will supply a lot of stuff to Iran including weapons and Iran in return will supply with crude oil or other kind of things to China similarly now they have signed a deal with Russia although Russia has not confirmed anything like that Iran says that we will be buying the Sukhoi jets from Russia as you know India also has a lot of Sukhoi jets Iran has been trying to make its own jets also for some time but again when you are a country which has so many sanctions against you by US when you have so many sanctions against you by other countries it is very very difficult to import spare parts to import that kind of technology to make any state of the art weapon Iran in 2018 did start a process did start a scheme for making their own fighter planes they were called the Corsair fighter planes but those fighter planes were not really something that Iran is very very comfortable with or Iran is very confident about that is why they are now going ahead and trying to see from where exactly can they buy it Iran as you know is a country that has always been at odds with Israel specifically they want to be prepared because Iran has been facing multiple sanctions for many many years now Israel has conducted many proxy attacks within Iran on Iran's nuclear facilities as well so they want to be better prepared and that is why they are also building their arsenal under which they have now decided to import this from Russia no details have come out about how many jets when how even the Russian side has not confirmed it is only Iran that has confirmed the same this is just a small comparison between the Rafale jets that we have as compared to the Sukhoi Su-35. Each and every jet that is available in the international market has different types of features. Some are known for their lightweight so that they can be maneuvered very easily. Like the Tejas for example is a light combat aircraft. Very light it can be maneuvered very easily. Some others are those which are well known to fly at a very high altitude some others are well known so that they can beat the radars they can be or they can fly at a stealth mode so depending on whatever your requirement is there are different types of fighter planes that are available this is a slight comparison that you can read between the Rafale jets and the Sukhoi Su-35 usually you will see <coughs> defense based questions are asked in the UPSC prelims from the past experience if you see what are the kind of defense based questions 90% of defense based questions are usually always on missiles there are very few questions on aircrafts but you can be prepared but 
more specifically my advice would always be focus more on missile based facts there have been questions on brahmos there have been question on prithvi akash there have been questions on different types of missiles coming in from different countries as well there are questions they will ask you name of a certain missile system and they will ask you with which country is associated they can ask you name of a missile and ask you from which country is india importing it so 90% questions on defense would be somewhere related to missiles only there are a few times when the question are on certain tank on certain aircraft but my advice would be first give priority to remembering all the data about important missiles that we have and then go on to the other part of the defense the next important news a very short simple news from science again is that world's fastest camera has just been invented by scientists from us and germany they have invented the world's fastest single shot laser camera which is considered as over 1000 times faster than the earlier cameras now fast camera basically means that the shutter speed is very fast it can actually take those events photo also very well which are very very short lived event so an event which is just a second or half a second even those events photos can be taken this is how this camera is important so what this camera did was they actually shot a very precise view of how the carbon flame or how cloud hydrocarbon flame produces soot do you know what soot is when you burn coal or uh, let's say anything that is hydrocarbon there is a black powdery substance that is produced when there is improper burning of hydrocarbon there is a black powdery substance that is produced that is called soot so how soot is produced how exactly is hydrocarbon how do hydrocarbon actually burn that was clicked by this camera this device is based on a new technology called laser sheet compressed ultra fast photography just to compare how fast this camera is if you have watch a television usually standard televisions have about 24 fps fps is frames per second so usually your tv shows your films etc are shot on 24 fps that is 24 frames per second this camera they can actually capture images at 12.5 billion frames per second so this will be much 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 faster than any camera that we have around us so they would be able to capture events at a much better scale they would be even able to capture events which are very very short lived so that they can give much more clarity to the scientists specifically this is not a camera that you and me we would require when we go out to shoot our instagram reels nothing like that this is something that the scientists would require if they have to study those very short lived events of how the hydrocarbon is burning what it is producing at what stage what are the burning stages that are now being seen that is why this camera is required they have certain pros and certain cons it's obviously a very expensive camera so don't even think about buying it don't search it on amazon it's not available there basically there are certain pros and certain cons the main con of this camera is it can only capture this it can only capture those things which are in the line of sight so only things which are in front of you <coughs> sorry which you can see that is the only thing that it can capture it cannot capture something which is very far off so for example you cannot expect that this camera will be sent to space and in the space they will be able to capture something very far off they would only be able to capture something that is in the line of sight that is the biggest disadvantage that they have the advantage as we discussed was that they are able to capture events which are very very short lived it can get a much detailed analysis of all these events for the scientific study specifically next article is about a vaccine from china a chinese origin vaccine for japanese encephalitis which is being now seen as almost 0% effective so a small trial is being conducted on certain children they have been getting some vaccine that is made in china vaccine against japanese encephalitis and now the children are being analyzed they are being tested how many antibodies have their have their human body generated and it is almost coming down to zero 
in simple terms the chinese made vaccine for japanese encephalitis is now turning out to be a dud it's turning out to be very 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 unsuccessful that is why in india also even after most of the children have been given vaccine against japanese encephalitis even then many children in india still get this disease and the reason may be because of the vaccine that we are using japanese encephalitis is covered under the immunization universal immunization program of the government of india under which children are given vaccine against japanese encephalitis but even then many districts in india see many many cases of this disease in gorakhpur specifically there are a lot of cases of japanese encephalitis this chinese vaccine has been used since 2006 now the question can be if it is being used since 2006 why did we not test it earlier again as i told you earlier as well the problem is vaccines medicines all of these have to be reengineered time and time again the diseases that they are working against those germs keep on mutating keep on changing their form and if the vaccine is not up to date if the medicine is not up to date with the changing mutation of that germ they will not be effective and that is what has happened in this case also in this study it has been seen that the chinese vaccine is not providing any kind of protection to the children this chinese vaccine is an example of live attenuated vaccine please do remember this this is a live attenuated vaccine and we'll discuss in just a bit what do you mean by live attenuated now what exactly is the alternative the good part is that we do have an alternative the alternative is that bharat biotech has made a new vaccine called genvac genvac is a vaccine that is using some other technology which is called inactivated vaccine so the chinese version was live attenuated and the bharat biotech version of the vaccine is inactivated vaccine that vaccine is now said to be much more effective that vaccine is building much more antibodies in the children's bodies especially after the second dose and it is said that government should go ahead and now take up the genvac vaccine as a part of universal immunization program from the prelims point of view there are two things that you have to remember from here Number one, the question can be: Genvac is a vaccine for which particular disease? So this is one fact that you have to remember. Second fact that you have to understand is: What is the difference between the different types of vaccine technologies? How is live attenuated vaccine different as compared to inactivated vaccine? See, live attenuated that was a Chinese vaccine. Those vaccines actually use live germs. germs of that particular disease which are not dead they are weak germs they are inserted in you, into your body so that antibodies can be developed against it please remember live attenuated means weakened germs are actually inserted in your body so that your body can create antibodies against it your body can understand how to fight against them in that case your body develops very strong antibodies but the problem is these kind of vaccines cannot be given to those who have a very low immunity if someone who has a very low immunity they are given the germs of the vaccine even though they are weak germs they may catch the disease from that itself these are live attenuated on the other hand there are inactivated vaccines which bharat biotech is developing these are considered as much safer in inactivated vaccines usually the germs are almost killed or if they are not killed then they are weakened very 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 largely so that their ability to multiply is neglected inactivated vaccines have those germs which are either dead germs or they are very weak germs so weak that they can't reproduce they can't multiply these vaccines can be given to those as well who have a lower immunity those who are very weak already they can be given this vaccine as well this is the polio vaccine so again live attenuated means the germ is being given to your body that is not a dead germ it's a weak germ but it is not dead there is a chance that you might get disease from that vaccine itself 
Why? Because if your body has very weak immunity, it can catch disease from that. Then the other one is the inactivated vaccine where dead germs would be given, where the germs do not have the ability to multiply, those would be given, they are safer, they can be given to even those who have a much lesser immunity as compared to the other. That is a difference between the two, please do remember that as well. The next news story is about crypto. <clears throat> as you would have known, we have discussed this earlier in the CNA as well, how crypto trading is now a part of PMLA, that is Prevention of Money Laundering Act. For PMLA, Prevention of Money Laundering Act, if you are found to be laundering money, then ED Enforcement Directorate will come after you. PMLA was a law that was passed in India in 2002. It came into being in 2005. PMLA is an act under which if you acquire money from anywhere illegally and you use that money to buy something, that becomes money laundering. So money laundering means if you get something illegally, let's say you go to a bank and you rob a bank, you take 5 crore rupees or 10 crore rupees from a bank. You keep that money with you, that is not money laundering. But when you then use that money to buy something, that will become money laundering. So money laundering is using that money that you acquired illegally to then buy something else. That is when <clears throat> ED will come in. Now, cryptocurrency trading has also become a part of this. So meaning that if you acquire money illegally and you use that to buy crypto assets, even then you will be under the PMLA. Even then the ED will come to you. That is the change that has happened now. Earlier, because crypto is such a new phenomena, we don't have a lot of laws about crypto. But now that the governments across the world are realizing the danger with cryptocurrency, countries around the world are making regulations for crypto. Now what will happen? As you know, you can buy cryptocurrency from a lot of different platforms. Those platforms now have to give a report to Government of India's Financial Intelligence Unit. The government's financial intelligence unit will keep a track who is buying how many cryptos, from where are you getting the money, what is the source of your money. If they believe that the source of money is illegal, if it is black money, they can come and ask you questions. This is what has happened. <clears throat> cryptocurrency, as you know, is a very recent phenomenon. As per many experts, right now, cryptocurrency around the world, if you add all of that up, is over $800 billion. 800 billion dollars is a lot, lot, lot of money. We used to have just Bitcoins and Ethereum, etc. Now we have hundreds of cryptocurrencies. All these cryptocurrencies, their value is over 800 billion dollars. And the countries around the world are worried because so much money can be utilized to any or for any negative thing, for any detrimental interest of the country as well. There are many countries, for example, right now, that have actually made regulations against cryptocurrency. Switzerland, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, all of them have made laws about cryptocurrency. US, UK, Canada, all of them have made certain laws about cryptocurrency. So India is not the first one to do this. There are many other countries that have done this. The reason being that cryptocurrency has actually given a push to a lot of crimes. There are so many hackers these days that hack into the government services and they want money in the form of cryptocurrency. In USA, for example, some of the biggest companies, some of the biggest oil refinery companies have been hacked and in return, the hackers have asked for money in cryptocurrency so that it cannot be tracked. So cryptocurrency has become a big, big, big problem that the nations around the world are trying to track. And India, including this in PMLA, is our effort to make sure that cryptocurrency is not misused against our own nation's interest. The last article for today's Hindu newspaper analysis is about Silicon Valley Bank, one of the largest and well-known banks in the US that has just collapsed overnight. Silicon Valley Bank is a very famous bank, especially for giving funding to startups coming from Silicon Valley. In fact, they have given a lot of funding to Indian government or Indian companies as well, Indian startups as well. It is said that many Indian startups might have their money in account of Silicon Valley Bank. So it might have an impact on them as well. But Silicon Valley Bank all of a sudden 
was shut down it was it stopped to work the government in us has sent its officials to understand what has happened around the world it is making a lot of news now what exactly has happened what are the problems behind this bank why did it just fall down it all started with the us federal reserves increasing their rate as you know around the world <clears throat> since inflation is increasing due to increasing inflation us and other countries want to control that inflation by their central bank deciding to increase their interest rate so basically whenever the inflation increases central banks want to suck out the money from the market they want the people to withdraw the money and they want the people to put the money in the bank so basically what is happening is federal reserves increase the rate meaning that it is becoming difficult for anyone to take money from federal reserves when people have it have difficulty in taking money from federal reserve they will not be investing it in the market so for investors it is very very difficult to invest money in the market when federal reserve is increasing the rate why because the money they will take from the banks becomes costlier so first problem that the bank had the money that they used to take from federal reserve became problematic investors did not have a lot of money then investors have their own crash cash crunch many investors withdrew money from the silicon valley bank account when everyone <clears throat> went to silicon valley bank to withdraw their money the bank all of a sudden was short of money see you would have seen this something called bank run bank run means let's assume today if all the customers of state bank of india go to state bank of india and say we want to <coughs> sorry we want to withdraw money the sbi will not be able to do that because all the money that we are given to sbi it is not in their account they have distributed it in the form of loan they have distributed it in the form of investment etc so if you automatically go or all of us go all together to the state bank to take the money they will not be able to do that the bank will collapse this will happen when people don't trust the bank if people stop trusting the bank all of them go to the bank and say that we want to take out our money <coughs> no bank would be able to give you the money because no bank has all your money in the accounts for the silicon valley bank also the same thing happened lot of people went to silicon valley bank told that we want to get our money back when silicon valley bank did not have the money what did they do they started selling their government securities or government treasuries as you call it government securities were being sold by the bank at a loss because they needed cash because they needed cash government securities were sold at a lower rate and that just increased their problem their stock when they tried to sell their stock so that they can earn some money the stock also started to reduce in value basically every single thing that the bank did to get more money to give to its own depositors all of that failed first they were not able to take loan from the fed because it was becoming difficult there was a cash crunch investors wanted to withdraw money from the bank the bank did not have so much money in the market in their accounts because they had already invested all that money then the bank tried to get money by selling their government securities that was also not possible because they were then selling it at a loss then the bank tried to sell their stocks even the stock started to plummet so they did not have money and overnight they were de declared as a bankrupt just a few days back this bank got an award for one of the best 20 banks of america do you know that just a few days back they got an award one of the best banks of america one of the 20 largest of america but now all of a sudden the bank has failed this brings us to the end of the session i have a couple of questions for you as you can see here i would really advise you all to write the answers to that once again reminding you please don't forget tomorrow and day after tomorrow the cna would be at 5 pm live and not at 10 am only for two days please remember tomorrow and day after that is monday and tuesday the cna will be live right here at 5 pm and not at 10 am just for the couple of days thank you so much for watching have a good day ahead bye bye jai hind